I'm doing is legal. This is why I believe I'll receive justice in the Howard Court. More to right, right center than the left. Oh, it is gone! He did it! He did it! It doesn't matter what your background is and where you come from. If you have dreams and you have goals, and that's all that really matters. a lot to Charlie. The freedom of expression that the entire world could see. Oh, boy, I should see. When you black, it's not a movement. It's a lifestyle. This is who we are. Adopted in 2003, the Rooney Rule is an NFL policy requiring every team with a head coaching vacancy to interview at least one or more diverse candidates. The policy is named after former Pittsburgh Steelers owner Dan Rooney. He was credited with spearheading the initiative when he was chairman of the league's diversity committee. In the 80 years of the NFL's existence before the rule was implemented, just seven head coaches of color were hired. This despite the NFL becoming a competition dominated by African-American footballers. In 2009, the Rooney Rule was expanded to include general manager and equivalent front office positions. A chance is the only thing Tony Dungy ever asked for. And when he finally got his, he made sure to reach back and make that opportunity available to plenty of others. Tony Dungy's firing as head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was one of the catalysts for the rule. The widely admired Dungy was released after the 2001 season his third in a row with a winning record, and fourth in six seasons with at least a trip to the NFC wildcard game. Dungy's firing, along with that of Dennis Green of the Minnesota Vikings, prompted a backlash. Research was published showing that black head coaches, despite winning a higher percentage of games, were less likely to be hired and more likely to be fired than their white counterparts. And Lovey Smith becomes Calls for affirmative action grew. And with Rooney's advocacy, the NFL recognized they had to do something. And Dungy, his work was quickly validated when the Bucks team he built went on to win the Super Bowl the season after his dismissal. The man himself was snapped up by the Colts where he led Indianapolis to a drought-breaking Super Bowl in 2007. As fate would have it, his opposing head coach that day was Lovey Smith, one of his former assistants at the Bucks. Together, they became the first African-American coaches in Super Bowl history. Friday, the two men whose teams will battle for that prize held a rare photo opportunity, underscoring the off-field friendship between Lovey Smith and Tony Dungy. Uh, we have two black head coaches leading our teams. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently. I think you can respect the opponent and have a relationship with them uh, before and after the football game. So that's how we're doing it. Awesome moment, uh, not only because of, of what that symbolized for African-American people, for African-American coaches, for the country in general, but more, more than that, because of who I was standing with and uh, the type of person I know Lovey is and the way he runs his team, uh, it's just a, a very, very proud moment for me. Two African-American head coaches in a Super Bowl and the Rooney Rule newly embedded in the NFL. In the early 2000s, the future looked promising. But years later, 
reality has not lived up to expectation in American football or many other sports around the world. The NFL's Rooney Rule introduced candidates of color to white owners and general managers who were otherwise reticent about the hiring of black men to be the face of their franchise. But after much positive publicity at the time of its implementation, the policy has not led to long-term systemic change. While as many black head coaches were hired in the six years following the Rooney Rule as the 80 years preceding it, there was soon regression to the mean. During the 2022 offseason, the number of African-American coaches fell to one. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell called the situation unacceptable and admitted the league was not doing a good enough job. Column inches were filled by the now annual outcry of the failure of affirmative action. Examples abounded of poorly credentialed white coaches and general managers prospering while careers of their black counterparts stalled. It became hard to avoid the conclusion that the rule provided little more than window dressing for team owners beholden to nobody. I'm still trying to progress and, um, and do the right thing. Um, for me, I, you know, I always wanted to be, a, I always wanted to do, you know, things in football, you know, after my career is over with. And, um, that just that just gives me an extra incentive to um, you know to become a GM and you know becoming a front office so you know I can I can change things for the better. Research by Indiana University suggests that despite its high profile, the Rooney Rule isn't even where an intervention is most useful. NFL head coaches are broadly recruited from the pool of available offensive and defensive coordinators who themselves are likely to have gained experience in the college system. Ahead of the 2022 season, only 12% of offensive coordinators and 34% of defensive coordinators were black. If the ambition is more black NFL head coaches, then more attention needs to be paid upstream before the compound effect of problematic hiring practices are felt. To me, you start an organization by finding a great leader. And I'm really thrilled to say that I believe we have found that leader that can really take us into the future. In 2022, former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores filed a suit against three NFL franchises and the league itself which he claims is racially segregated and is managed much like a plantation. Flores was fired by the Dolphins, despite leading the team to back-to-back -to -back winning seasons for the first time since 2003. In an echo of the situation faced by Colin Kaepernick when he spoke out against the league, Flores said, I understand that I may be risking coaching the game that I love, and that has done so much for my family and me. My sincere hope is that by standing up against systemic racism in the NFL, others will join me to ensure that positive change is made for generations to come. Cases like Flores are demonstrating that confidence in both the spirit and application of the Rooney Rule is evaporating. The NFL is not alone in governing a sport that relies heavily on the labor of black athletes, often to the detriment of their health and well-being, without employing a commensurate number of black coaches. The situation in soccer has been a concern for a long time. While black players have become the norm at the very top of the game, black coaches remain scarce in the big leagues. Patrick Vieira became only the 10th black Premier League manager when he took charge of Crystal Palace in 2021, 30 years after the competition launched. For some advocates, the Rooney Rule remains the touch point 
despite the challenges proving its efficacy. I've spoken about the, an English version of the Rooney, where I think it will be a, a huge step forward um, in England in terms of giving coaches and managers from ethnic minority backgrounds an opportunity to at least put their case forward. And I, I see that, you know, if it is the best man for the job, then someone else having an interview, which is not um, stopping someone else taking an interview, can only be a positive thing for the person making that decision. It's a personal view. Um, I believe that it would be a huge step forward. Because the proportion of black footballers in the English system is not as overwhelming as in the NFL, the conversation sits more broadly in the realm of diversity. By diverse, we mean diverse in terms of gender and race, diversity of thought. What you want is the most talented people around to be part of that journey to ensure organizations develop effectively. Every piece of research tells us that where you have that, performance is better. Uh, and so that's why I'm very passionate about ensuring that we have better diversity for the future. Baseball has similar concerns. Major League Baseball prides itself on having broken the color barrier in professional sport. But in 2021, only two of 30 managers in Major League Baseball were black. There was no black general manager in the league. And in the minors, only 10 of 120 full season clubs were headed by black managers. The world over, black athletes are at the forefront of sporting excellence, but they are not trusted consistently to progress into leadership roles. Speaking specifically about English football, the psychologist Bina Candola detailed the obstacle The FA and football clubs need to pay more attention to biases, both conscious and unconscious, that can impact our decision-making in terms of who we select, promote, and develop for leadership roles within the game, he said. Initiatives like the Rooney Rule are born of good intentions, but their ineffectiveness highlights the much broader structural forces in action. For now, black athletes are incentivized to dominate on the field of play. But to the sports industrial complex, that's where their usefulness ends. Celia <laughs> Calise's childhood in the black township of Suede in Port Elizabeth was heartbreaking. When he was five years old, he collected his mother's teeth from the street after she had been assaulted. Before his teens, he had seen a man stoned to death. He was perpetually hungry, and his favorite toy was a brick. It's a miracle that by the age of 28, that child had grown into the captain of the World Cup winning Springboks and admired universally as one of the sports leaders of his generation. We actually didn't physically have food or didn't have shoes to wear or couldn't get to school. And then you think, yeah, he sits as a captain and he, and he, and he led South Africa to hold this cup. I think that, that should sum up uh, what CIA is. The sport of rugby is a powerful force in South Africa. It delivered one of the country's most symbolic images in 1995 when Nelson Mandela wore a Springbok jersey for the presentation of the World Cup trophy to Francois Pina. The Rainbow Nation was still coming to terms with decades of apartheid, and the rugby team pointed towards a brighter future. But the winds of change blew gently. 20 years later, non-white internationals were still in the minority, despite people of color comprising the overwhelming majority of South Africa's population. The political capital of 95 and a second World Cup victory 12 years later was being squandered.
Khaleesi debuted for the Springboks in 2013. With discontent over the racial composition of South Africa's squad coming to the boil. He had reached the pinnacle of his profession thanks to rugby scholarships lifting him out of poverty and hothousing him in one of South Africa's finest institutions. When he first arrived at the prestigious Gray School, just 20 minutes drive from his township, he was malnourished and didn't speak English, only his local language of Tosa. He overcame these obstacles and progressed through the ranks quickly, becoming an imposing back row forward at junior and provincial levels. The final step up was a formality. His timing was perfect. The Springboks were ready for a change, and by the time Khaleesi had bedded into the test arena, he was the ideal man to lead it. I think there was a stage in South Africa uh, when being a professional rugby player was just earning a good paycheck. Uh, but I think currently players understand that, listen, if I want to be a professional rugby player, it means I have to work really hard. Rossi Erasmus was installed as South Africa's director of rugby in 2017 and head coach the following year. Not long afterwards, Khaleesi was appointed the first black captain in Springboks history. And obviously, it's a big, big moment for the country to have uh, Khaleesi as captain. Together with Erasmus, Khaleesi made restoring pride to the Springbok jersey a priority. As soon as he came, you know, he just made us made it clear that the, the Springbok is the most important thing. Where in the past, I think most of us, we tried to build ourselves by our social media so and all those kind of things. And he just brought us back to, the, to earth and told us, you have to play well first and everything else will come. The message was consistent from the top down. Use rugby as a means of uniting South Africa and make the country proud. We not only want to inspire sports, we want to inspire people in general and kids in general that you can achieve whatever you want to achieve, no matter what your current situation is, as long as you just put your heart on everything and just work as hard as you can. Because now they can see it's been done before. Barriers have been broken. You know, they have living proof of it. It's happening. At the 2019 Rugby World Cup, Khaleesi Springbok succeeded in their inspirational ambition. When it comes to the greatest boxer of all time, Floyd Mayweather has some opinions. Well, you know, I'm, I'm TBE. You know, Ali was considered the greatest. I call myself TBE, which is the best ever. <laughs> it's hard to argue. He retired with an unblemished 50 and zero record and more money than any other boxer in history. He beat some of the best fighters of his generation, legends like Manny Pacquiao, Miguel Cotto, Canelo Alvarez, and Oscar de la Hoya. If you were that good, you might call yourself TBE as well. Celia Khaleesi's South Africa were not among the favorites heading into the 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan. So when they lost their opening match to New Zealand's mighty All Blacks, there was no hint of what was to follow. But the draw opened up favorably, gifting the Springboks an armchair ride to the semifinals. The bandwagon was rolling. What we do, we're in a place of privilege. You know, we're doing what we love each and every single day, and that we are able to put a smile on someone's face, or we are able to, for a moment in time, let everybody else just, you know, just forget or put their problems aside and focus on what we do. After scraping past Wales, South Africa came up against favorites England in the final. 
and the Springboks played the game of their lives, powering to a 32-12 victory. We felt very, very grateful that, uh, that these 15 guys on the field could lift 57 million back home. It was an amazing, amazing achievement. And to see Sia Colisi lead the team was a phenomenal... It says lots about how far the country has come in uh, 25 short years. To see the joy in my teammates' faces, uh, that was the, the best thing, I think, for me, because I know how hard it worked and how hard the coaches have worked, and uh, we're really just grateful. I feel like crying. And once again, you know, you know, we come from different backgrounds, different races, and we came together with one goal, and we wanted to achieve it. I really hope that we've done that for South Africa to show that we, we can pull together if we want to win, win, achieve something. Khaleesi was heralded the world over as a hero, the softly spoken leader of men who united South Africa. We knew it was much more than just for our personal gains. It was for the country. Now, every single kid in our country, we have a diverse country and we have 11 official languages. Now they can be themselves, you know, because most of them were represented in that team, which is something that we are proud of as a team. And, uh, and you know, you can be whatever you want to do in this life. That's what we showed out there. We all come from different background and, and, and different cultures and races, but we wanted one thing. We had one goal in, in, in common, and we just fought for it with everything we could and put our own personal goals and dreams aside and just fought for the country and the team, and we achieved it. Admirers of the caliber of Roger Federer lined up to lavish praise. Khaleesi is always quick to share the credit. I don't feel it's an individual job. You know, I, if I've got great leaders around me, why not use them, you know? And, you know, and I know that there's gonna be tough calls I've made and I'll obviously make them, but I'll always um, get like, um, help if I need help from my leaders because I'm, I'm just that type of person. That's the way I do things because I don't believe I do know everything. Sia Khaleesi's journey from abject poverty to unifying force underlines the transformative power of sport. That was my dad's dream one day to ever take me to, to like, all these places all around the world, but he didn't have the means, and that's why I'm so grateful for rugby, that um, it, it allows me to be able to do such things. Now, mindful of his influence during a global pandemic, Khaleesi's thoughts have broadened from rugby to the world beyond, a world full of pitfalls that he knows all too well. He is vocal in condemnation of the gender violence of his youth, honest about his own alcohol abuse and other addictions, and unafraid to encourage men to open up, speak out, and if they need to, cry. Hopefully, whatever we do right now, to be able to look after people, I hope this carries on. It doesn't stop. We'll make sure. We want it to be, a, like I was saying earlier to my we want it to be a world where no charity um, or organizations like that are needed. Like the work that we do as a foundation, hopefully one day it's never needed because everything is equal, you know? If you, it doesn't matter where you wake up one day, you don't have to worry whether you're going to get a meal or not. In 1995, a black South African in a Springbok jersey handed over the Rugby World Cup. 24 years later, another black South African in a Springbok jersey accepted it. Sia Khaleesi is determined to make the most of his good fortune. 